thank you. Good evening. We are in Paris. That's the last <coughs> evening of the of the summer for the type talk, and uh, we are happy to be with you from uh, abroad, from any place in the world, watching us in same time that all these people in Paris. Uh, tonight we have two excellent speakers. Uh, we will start with uh, Stéphane Elbaz, and um, he will uh, giving a talk uh, for about one hour. We will have a break. We'll be off, and we'll come back with the second talk with Summerstone. So for now, I will present uh, Stéphane Elbaz, who count a lot of me for me. Um, Stéphane is um, is um, a graphic di designer who is based in New York. But I have a story with Stefan to, to tell you about a little bit, to introduce the talk of Stefan. First time I met Stefan was simply to refuse him the access to my type design class in NSAD back in 2003. So at the time, the class was small, and uh, it was uh, anyone can came. So but the first who arrived uh, accepted the other uh, uh, refused for the year. And Stefan was. Um, you, are, you were the 14 or the 15, so it was stopped at 14 seats. And Stefan, um, Stefan try, uh, um, tried to be back the next year. And he was accepted because it was on the first people <laughs> this time. <laughs> but I realized very much uh, the second year, or the first year with Stefan, but second try of Stefan, that Stefan was very good at designing typeface. Um, I got immediately, he, he got immediately the right eyes to visualize letter form counters and play with them. I never have seen someone with this ability from the first day as him in my long career as a teacher. After he left NSAD, we lost contact a little bit, but he continued to design typeface. He came back at Tipo Fonry for a summer in 2007 or 8, I don't recall exactly, to complete his Geneo typeface. In fact, he has a couple of typeface at the time, and he asked to me, which one I have to continue, or something like that. And I say, yeah, you know, it can be a good candidate, something like that. And he said, okay, okay, I will continue to work on it for a few weeks at Tipo Fonry. And uh, so he sent the typeface at the TDC and got an award for, for it a few months later. So, okay, it proves that he has some, some capacity to design typeface. Um, this typeface, we published it in 2012 at Tipo Fonry. In 2008, he moved to New York um, he, he, so to, st to start a new, a new career, um, a, new, uh, a new life uh, in New York. And very quickly, he began to work in a digital publication. So he joined uh, uh, an ad agency. And for this agency, I've done, conducted a lot of redesign of good publications like Vanity Fair, L LA Times interview and many other. So uh, Stefan was something, someone quite important in New York, designing a good publication online with a basis from uh, NSAD school or even Swiss school, but adap adapted to the to the web design, but with more larger way to see uh, all the design can be on, on, on the screen. Um, he was also, when he left this company, he, he joined a new company called The Intercept. And for this publication, he got the, the change to design the publication from by, by itself, from the logotype to the layout and even to design typeface. So he's probably the first designer in the world to be able to design a publication, to do the identity, to, do, uh, to design the typeface for the launch of the publication online. Generally, when a new publication is launched online or on paper, the type designer is not the one who does the design, it's a team of people. And Stefan was able to do everything um, all together alone. Um, I, was, I was in New York in 2012, invited by Summerstone on Cara Di Eduardo for Type Cooper uh, to teach there. It was an influence to launch Type Paris later, but at this time, I, because Stefan was in, in New York, I said, Stefan, could you join me to teach for five weeks? And he said, uh, yes, he never teach at the time, but we spent a very uh, good moment together in for, for the five weeks there. there. So, um, so in 2014, one, we have the idea to launch Type Paris. 
uh, we've got a call with Summerstone on, on Cardi Eduardo. I will come back to this story a little later. And then, so when, when we get the, the idea that it was possible to do it, I ask uh, naturally to Stefan to do the identity of, of Type Paris so that it's logotype, identity, you have done the website, all the systems that we, we use, and even he designed such thing we have on the screen. On, on, uh, obviously, Stefan was on the core team of Type Paris from the first day. Even the first people working on the Type Paris program with me and with Veronique, and then p other people joined. But so to have Stefan here as uh, um, instructor, teacher for the week, it's absolutely wonderful after the, to be on the first on the third year of the Thai Paris. So um, I can say that I admire, as a, uh, admire Stéphane as a talented creative director, a talented uh, typeface designer. Uh, Stéphane is on my smallest circle ever. He's the one, it's sort of young brother by heart as well as Aaron Levin who is not there tonight. So these, these two people, that's the first people I ask when I need advice on anything. So they are very close people for me. So I'm very happy to introduce Stéphane Elbaz, who was an active member of the organization of Thai Paris, I've said already before. And I'm very happy to have you in Paris for your talk. So welcome, Stéphane. Thank you, Jean-François. Uh, what an introduction, thanks. <laughs> uh, well, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, <laughs> I was joking yesterday saying like I, was, I would prepare a poem for Jean-François to start with, but I was joking, I didn't finish the poem. I started it, but I didn't finish it. But like privately, I, I could read it to you. Okay, um, okay so Jean-François said uh, a lot of things about like what, I, what I've been doing the last, uh, the past, so I've been in New York for what, like about 10 years? And Jean-François described it a bit, like my, what I've been doing. Uh, I'm going to uh, open the talk. And um, there's like few things I'm going, I mean, there's a lot of things I'm going to uh, detail. Oh. oh, it's already there, okay. So, um, so I called the talk later screens and time. Uh, I'm trying to have a sequence of projects, uh, like all the things I'm doing, like web products and like, uh, and like how I always go back to typography. I always go back and forth between uh, uh, the screens, the web product, uh, the digital product and typography. And like sometime I combine them, but not all the time. Uh, and like the effect of time over the thing and how the, th uh, like how the time works with like these different projects. So first thing, uh, so, in 2008, I'm still in Paris. I'm about to leave to New York. And uh, we've been contacted by um, um, Christophe Renard, who's the art director of Stiletto Magazine. And um, me and uh, Félix de Marne from Chéri Studio. And we work, um, we help him on the redesign of uh, the Stiletto Magazine. So Stiletto Magazine is a fiction and luxury magazine. And quite frankly, it was pretty good to uh, work on such a project before moving to New York because there's nothing that's French as something like that. Like, uh, so I'll go fast on, the, on this kind of project, but uh, I'll show you quickly what the work we've done. Um, so we started with the uh, nameplate, the logo, and um, so <laughs> sometime I could be a bit conceptual, but not that much actually, but uh, this time we, with Felix, <laughs> you can see that actually we made a Dido to look fashion, and you can see that the the terminals look like actually stiletto shoes, right? <laughs> so it's quite literal. Uh, and uh, we all, what's also uh, interesting is that we, we also like remove some, oh, I don't have a pointer. We remove some flesh in the middle here, right? So it was an interesting feature. We did that for the S to uh, remove the flesh at the top and the bottom to give some character to the, to the lettering. It was like a bit, um, that's a bit more aggressive than an average Dido or Bodoni. Oh, we broke everything. I 
Okay, so the, so we started with the nameplate, um, and we are mm, fairly happy with it. So like some in use of the, and then we st we moved to like do uh, some headline typeface. That's funny this thing, all right? <laughs> uh, so we started to do like a head headline typeface for the magazine based on the logo. So we did um, we did uh, two optical um, two optical weights for the condensed version, and we had made something larger, and like feel like almost like a skeleton version of a Dido, with like kind of like it's already the contrast between like the round shape and the like rectangular shapes to make it like a bit like basically look fashiony and cool. Um, and uh, well, yeah, here's here uh, in context. And when we did that, actually, we brought back some of the flesh in these terminals, actually, to like work better with the rest of the alphabet. So I'm going just through the different version of the types. That's a very high contrast. And that this one is the large one that is like almost a skeleton version. Um, so one, two more in use, and I'll go to the next project. Um, actually, um, it was a fun project. And uh, I was a bit surprised that the, I mean, the, we work with uh, Christophe Renard and uh, I was thinking while I was doing it, like, well, it looks cool. I'm happy to work on this project. It's very difficult to use though. So they, um, they kept using for like a couple or three years and they moved to something else. They kept the masthead, but like, I think that then they, they actually they made a larger format of the magazine, but I don't think they used that much these types anymore. But for me, it was a, a great project before moving to New York because as I said before, like, uh, it felt really French when I was arriving in New York. It's like, the, it's chic, it's like Dido, it's like fashion-y, luxury, it was perfect. Um, so then in New York, I started to work for an agency. So what, so working in an agency, the agency was called, uh, is called Code and Series, like quite big agency in New York. Um, and uh, usually I'm going to say we most of the time because basically I'm not the one doing everything. We are like, it's a team of people. So for example, like, First, one of the first projects that, well, I started with, well, actually, to, to like to detail the connection, when, I, when I've been hired, they probably seen like my portfolio and like the stiletto kind of project. I work for like some other fashion and, st and luxury stuff. And, uh, and they like that, the, they, were, they were about to start Vogue.com project. So they looked at my portfolio and said, like, oh yeah, we need to come with us. Um, so I started to work with Vogue and then like later I worked on an interview magazine. And I worked like mainly with a, uh, uh, Brandon Ralph, who's the one of the founder of the company, who's be, who had a great influence on me. So Interview Magazine was one of the first projects I worked on too. Uh, so Interview Magazine is, is, uh, is been founded, I mean, I don't have my notes, but like in the late 70s, I think. And uh, it was famous mainly because it was uh, uh, led by uh, Andy Warhol. Um, and uh, you can recognize like all these, these covers are um, from the 80s are uh, very iconic covers with these uh, uh, Bernstein illustrations. Uh, when I uh, started working on the project in 2011, uh, Fabien Baron and Steele and uh, Carl, Carl Templer are leading the, the art direction and the editorial direction of the magazine. Uh, and uh, I think Interview is still a landmark in New York, uh, even today, for luxury, like basically it's culture, uh, trans culture, fashion, luxury. And it's like a, it's like a, it's very large format it's, uh, and uh, always like with very good photography. Um, so uh, Fabien Baron uh, gave this aesthetic. I think it's an interesting aesthetic actually. Uh, you see like he's, he's having, well, he used this uh, Scotch ramen. Uh, you see like a lot of capitalization. It's like really <laughs> fashion over function. You can't really read this. Uh, and he's using that this like black bar. It basically is like the it looks like a manual composition when you use like to like put blocks of text in a frame. But like the, these black black box are kind of fillers between them. But like they're marking black bars instead of being transparent, right? So I use them in different places on, in the magazine. And you see that's uh, so I don't come. I'm going when I start designing. Basically, I don't start from scratch. I'm going to have to adapt uh, this aesthetic to a web product. Now, um, one thing I have to say also that this web, I wanted to start with this website because basically this website is a survivor. Uh, I designed it in 2011. I don't have, I think, one website that old that survived. So like 
basically when you're designing for the web or digital product, you're basically it's ephemeral. It's designed to be dead in a couple of years. It can survive like Reaper. This one is like a, it's, a, it's an exception, uh, but like it's, I'm surprised that it's, it lasted like that long. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's surprising. Anyway, uh, I think it it's, uh, was important to me, so I'm going to just play this, but uh, at this point, like working with Brandon, uh, we were looking at the analytics and we first we figured a lot of things that actually um, kind of shaped my mindset for the future project. A lot of like mechanism of things I've seen here helped me conceptualize future projects. So, so like the aesthetic uh, was kind of sad, but like the way we, we adapted it for the web was, was like interesting. So first thing we did is, so at this time, 2011, um, most web publications try to put everything at the top of the page. We have this, called, this thing called the fold. So like it's something coming from the print, you know, the fold is like the thing you see at the top of the page. Like when you're folding a newspaper, it's like what you see above. Uh, so f that's the first thing we wanted to break. It's like we, we kind of like this, in we had this instinct that actually people would be scrolling anyway. Um, and actually, with analytics, we figured actually that's what they were doing. Anyone would scroll the page, right? At this time, it was not like obvious, but like other thing we discovered actually is people were not like clicking on navigations. So they were not like going into menu and say click on like video section or fashion section. Fashion section. Better? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we didn't put like a navigation bar at the top. And these things on the side were not actually navigations. It was not a menu. We don't jump you to another page. It, was, it would be an anchor that would drive you down the page. So we tried to place everything that we thought was relevant for the users inside the page itself and not uh, inside a menu, right? So I'm going to play the Okay, yeah. So, so we built the page to, to like surface all the sections inside. Everything we saw like from each section that were relevant for the user, we would fit it inside the home page. And we use these like large blocks to like basically segment the page and surface like the different sections. So basically instead of having, and you see we brought back a, a navigation at the top, but just after you start scrolling. So the main, the main takeaway from this is, is that it's like we figured that actually like people don't engage with like UX, navigation, and all these kind of things. Like people engage with content. If you think something is relevant for the user, just like, like promote it inside the page. If it's not relevant, like you can bury inside the navigation, but like basically no one, no one to, go, to go there. Uh, also like during this, pro during this project, I started to do like motion mockups. So basically like what you see here, like the say, the way things are like locking and like the way the content scroll at the, on the side. Um, this was fairly new at the time. Like that's like, um, yeah, it was fairly new at the time and uh, there's no way we could have explained that to a client without having all like a build, like a, a developer spending some time to put it in motion or like me doing like a motion visual to like explain to the client. And that's where actually I, I realized that motion was a key component of like visual design. We couldn't, we couldn't just uh, stick to like make static comps and show it to the client. It has to be like, basically like all the screens were like motion devices. Right? Um, so there was one, like that was the, the two biggest takeaway. Uh, and like one other thing that is funny is like, one thing that is difficult on the web is um, you're doing templates. Most of the time you're doing templates, um, for publishing platforms I mean, you're doing templates. So for example, like when you have like here, Sam Richardson. So this is the intended uh, type size, right? Now, uh, if you go to the next slide, you see this long Schwarzenegger name cannot fit in this width w with like such a, lo such a long name, right? So first thing is like basically, <laughs> Now each time I'm doing a, a column of body copy, I just make sure that I can fit Schwarzenegger in it. That's my <laughs> test word. So that's the first thing. Two, like at this time, we just figured a way to adapt. So we have an intended size and we just like dynamically, you had like the right, adapt the size of the font and the type setting to fit the column, right? So again, like it's 2011, that was fairly new at the time, right? So that's it for interview. Now, uh, Jean-Francois talked about this project, uh, Genio, so that I finished at, at Typo Fondry. So I'll go quickly about it. I just want to present what was the, 
the idea of it. So I started working on, on this thing. And what I had in mind was to do something like a between actually a type machine. So I'm not very knowledgeable about type typewriters. Uh, so like for example, I, I searched, I Googled something. I Googled like I know it's a famous brand of, of uh, uh, Remington is a famous brand of, of typewriter. And um, so I, I know I wanted to have like this kind of like typewriter fitting, but like mixed with something else. So that's the typewriter. Uh, and uh, mixed with something more like organic, more floral. So I started designing these things. So I had like this kind of uh, like very thin, very low contrast. The serif were like as thick as the stems. And like I had like this kind of like bracketed, uh, uh, bracketed serif at the top that looks very mechanical. And I had like this round curve that were like more organic. And I was started playing with these uh, open counters. So I applied these open counters to uh, many shapes in the alphabet. I mean, the weirdest one was this one. The G was like really weird. <laughs> and uh, it ended up being looking like that. So I, I was mainly working on the, on the scene weight first. And um, so I hope he has this kind of feeling. It's like half like something that feels a bit like typewriter, but like also like kind of organic, like more traditional. Uh, and then I extended the project to uh, like more weights, and so like for example, like here, like the there's no typewriter. It's like you, I, you totally lose it if you like have this kind of weight. But uh, but uh, it was like really like something that helped me learn how to like basically I had to rationalize a project, build a larger family. Um, basically, it was like a really like a long exercise to uh, and like Jean Francois was uh, totally instrumental in this to help me like finalize this project actually. So yeah. So I have more types, you see. Yeah, some text and um, the scene weight again. The italics are more traditional a bit, but I keep the open counters in them. That's it. Later, 2012, um, so I've been contacted by Florence Bellisson at BOTC to uh, work on a Sephora uh, brand typeface. And uh, um, so she sent me the, she, they had an idea already of what they don't to do with Sephora. They have like a typeface ID. So I contacted Jean-Francois and the craft to help me with the project and work together. So, and this is like a few like uh, application of it at starting. So you see like they came with this idea of like, because Sephora is like the stripes brand. They have the stripes on all their store and they have like a small sign with stripes and they wanted to put the stripes inside the letters, right, to apply the visual, the, the stripes language inside the text. And uh, um, what they sent first was uh, Century Gothic. Uh, that's the, they were the starting point. Like you need, Century Gothic is like used, it's like a Futura, it's very fashionable, you've seen in a lot of, it's very popular in fashion magazines. And usually like um, when we receive this kind of project, we just say like, oh, we don't say like, oh cool, we're going to like, uh, like take Century Gothic and put some stripes and like put it in a software and like send it back to you. Uh, usually, I mean, uh, not usually, we never do that actually. <laughs> we never do anything like that. Um, you, we look at the problem, at the concept and then, then start working on what would be the optimal shape for it. So that's the, the sans serif uh, I designed for. Um, and uh, you see like there's for example like the R is very narrow here, it's loud, wider here the D is, the D is also in the wider and uh, it looks like we could say like it loses a bit of elegance but at the same time like we are trying to optimize to have like a better readability and better, better impact so all the decision we made was based on the stripe system so we made a lot of like design decision to make it sure actually we, w we get the best trade between the effect and the readability. So for example, like here, is v I mean, it's very cool, like this like very geometric C and the narrow S, but uh, when, you, well, when you apply the stripes, for example, like having these kind of terminals finishing that way, basically reveal more of the letter shape and, and therefore like make it more readable. So I was being, so usually it's like this kind of like, uh, I take a typeface and I take my scissors and I shape some stuff. 
usually doesn't work really well. You need to spend some time figuring out like what kind of shit you're doing. Um, then, uh, thanks to the craft uh, uh, capacities, we made a script uh, in the open type to make it much easier to apply these identities throughout the whole document. Because, you know, it was supposed to be applied to uh, many countries. So basically we wanted to make it very easy to make it look the way it was intended uh, uh, from the get-go. So basically this was like a, a script that you, like anyone would like start typing and like basically would like distribute the shapes in a specific uh, order to optimize the look of the text. And um, at the end, there's like, a, so I don't know, there was like, a, a, um, I can replay it maybe. At the end you'll see like there's like a transparent character where you can like switch from one set to another to help like create some more variations. But uh, it's like actually it's really cool that we've been able to do something that is that complete in terms of like a execution where the designer just had to install the font and pretty much like hold this work of picking what, where do I put like filled in, filled in letters, where do I do stripes is pretty much done for it, for him. The character set, so there's some these are some Cyrillic and some Greek. So you see, is in application in Russia, in Greece, in like in Turkey, in like many countries in China. And uh, here is like few applications when they release the project. So uh, again, it's the art direction of France Bison. She 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 made some st uh, she commissioned some photography to make some stunning photo, kind of like psychedelic. I don't know, like a, it's really cool photography to go with it. That's it. Now, LA Times. Uh, so after that, I worked uh, with Scott and Siri again for LA Times. So like, what, LA Times is a, it's a, it's a big publication. It's a big newspaper. Basically, it's the New York Times of the West Coast. So it was a huge project for me. I mean, even for Scott and Siri, I think, I mean, I don't see a lot of, like New York Times, w like don't do, don't take an agency to redesign their website. It's too big. They do it internally, so it was like a kind of a lifetime opportunity for us to work on such a big project. The timeline was fairly short. I don't remember exactly, but like for design, I guess it was less than six months for like such a big project. It was, it wasn't uh, that big. So that's the historical building in LA. We're uh, having the we were having presentation there. Um, here I'm just presenting the print. So the print. So that's uh, from 1992. So actually, I was trying to find back online the, the when Roger Black redesigned the LA, LA Times. But I, s I think remembering, I couldn't find these documents, but like I think remembering that the re Roger Black redesigned the LA Times in 2007. So I tried to find like a, um, a cover from 2007. And it came with a set of fonts from Font Bureau as always with Roger Black. So like most of the fonts, or I think all the fonts are designed by uh, David Berlow. And the web in 2013 looks, looked like this, right? It's, a, it's not uncommon. F actually, LA, LA Times, um, New York Times, actually a lot of public news publication looked like what you're looking at right now. It's a bit dense. Uh, there's ads, a lot of text, a lot of like, well, basically a very long page with a lot of tiny text and like you really don't know who's going down there to click on something. Um, but um, anyway, at this time we already knew that actually the home page like didn't matter much. So now when we are like starting designing anything, and it was for the times, we don't like come and show the home page. We uh, show, we start with the article page. So I'll show you that. I'll show you uh, uh, how we started the project. So that's an article. And uh, you see like but the tone is very different from what you've seen before. And you're scrolling into um, a section page. So it's comparable to a home page, right? So you, well, so you have like a nav on the side here. And you could say that actually, well, it's as dense. It's a lot of text, but it's bigger, right? So it's true, it's a bit bigger. It's still like quite dense. But um, I'll detail a bit more about this, but like, Actually, it's a bit different. It's more, it's more like modular. At this time, we figured that actually we could, uh, it's looping. Um, we couldn't keep uh, doing these static pages. So for example, like you would go on LA Times or even New York Times every day, and like whatever is the news today, 
whatever is the time of the day, if it's in the morning or at night or at midnight, it would look exactly the same. It would be like this is the same page. Uh, so at this time we knew, uh, we actually we've been trying to pitch this kind of, con I mean the, the modularity, the, like the flexibility for, for quite some time already, but like this time we were like say, well, for the other times it needs to change, and it needs to look more modern. Um, the other thing also, uh, for example, like the sign nav. So I wasn't super convinced by that actually. I was working with uh, Dan Gardner, who's the, the other founder of Codent Theory. I was into like read the sign nav. I made some sign nav on, on the past and I was like, huh, takes a lot of real estate. It's not super practical. And I got, actually I got used to it and actually I actually was a smart move. I actually it got killed after. But I think for the launch, it gives a very modern look and it was an putting an emphasis on the fact that it was a long scroll page. And uh, actually the fact that it was like looked very modern at the time, actually was really good for LA Times, I think, because like before it looked, the page looks a bit antiquated. Like having something that looked like very modern, more modern like other like news publication at the time, was like a very good thing for the LA Times to be refreshed. Now, disclaimer. So I'm going to talk about grid structure a bit. So if you thought it was boring before, well, it's getting worse now, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so bear with me for, s for five minutes. It's going, to be very, it's going to be a bit nerdy about the grid structure, okay? So each time I hear grid structure, I'm thinking about this guy first. It's Carl Gerstner. Carl Gerstner, Gerstner. Uh, so I discovered this guy when I was at school and I was at attending the class of Rudy Meyer, the, my, uh, the great teacher of the Art Décoratif de Paris. Uh, and uh, like when I think about the grid, I think about the, his grid, this one. And this grid is like, so f when you, if I say it, it's just like, it sounds like, well, it's, what about it? It's just like, it's like nothing special. But like basically when you look at this, you say, well, like I'm going to divide the format of the page in 58 columns. And then just because I do that, I have my divider is 58. I can have divide the format by two by three by four by five and by six. Which is like basically when you're building a, a, a grid structure based on a divider, you want to like have as much flexibility as possible. So, and the fact that it was square, it was even like, oh wow. So anyway, but the main thing actually is that when I started to work on, on digital publication, well, I had this instruction from the Art Decorative from Rudy Meyer, that's how I learned from him, that actually a grid was attached to a divider, like this like kind of like segmentation of the page in small columns, which basically like most people, I didn't see most people doing it, at least in New York, like using the divider uh, of the whole format to like start a grid and have some flexibility. So now uh, going back to digital, at the time, so first we were doing like, like a, a, a web product for desktop easy, we are doing a grid structure. Let's say we, we are doing a four or five column grid. And then came the phones and we're like, well, okay. So first there's been hem dots and uh, then came the uh, iPad. And uh, like obviously it was Apple, so everyone need to, need to have an iPad. And uh, at this time there was a lot of talk about like um, atomic design. So how, for example, atomic design, if you've never heard of that, is uh, basically when you start designing a website, you're just like going to start with like an arrow, then an arrow inside a box would be a button, and then you're going to have a header, and like all these things are like atoms, become molecules, become organism, and you combine them, and this, it does like templates, that pages, right? But there was no much thinking about like the, like the structure of the pages itself as a, as a grid system, right? And what's a pra what was the practice in web agencies, in digital agencies was, well, First, well, we know about this guy. It's like, it's easy. It's like, a, the width's going to be like, well, say 1280 pixels. And for the rest, uh, we're going to do things that adapt uh, whatever like Apple is, is uh, whatever like how Apple's flagship is. So like, we're going to do it for the iPhone and we're going to do it for the iPad, right? And uh, we optimize for this device and we're good. Well, uh, so first of all, like this time, there was like already like a new iPad coming out was the iPad mini, so like a new one. And then like if you look at it actually, your audience is not using this device at all. I mean uh, most of your audience is like probably Android phones and stuff, and there's going to be dozens of them, and Apple is like changing the format every year, so well basically it's really not like future proof like the way you're doing things, right? So I say like, hmm, 
think about it. Think for a minute before like starting to do a huge project like LA Time. Think about like the grid structure. Think about how to define breakpoints, so, like breakpoints uh, in responsive design. So, um, so you know what's responsive design? Responsive design is the fact that actually you can like use the same code to serve like the iPhone, the desktop, and the tablets. It's all the same code that actually adapting to all the sizes, right? Now, uh, the way we are defining breakpoints and stuff, it wasn't clear. It was like mainly focusing on this specific device. So I said, well, is there a way to, another way to like figure out how to start having breakpoints? So I said, what if actually we, what about like cr trying to create archetypes based on the content itself? Not about, the, not like starting from the devices because they're changing all the time, but like the actual content, how the content would adapt to different widths. And I say, well, like, what would be the smallest unit for something like text heavy, like LA Times, so a multi column grid with like a lot of stacks? And I say, well, like, maybe we, what we could do is like take the smaller body copy size and see how narrow the column can be with this smaller copy. So I just say, like, okay, like, reduce it and say, well, like, okay, 180 point is probably, I can go n narrower than that. Like, the, after that, it's just like, it's not like, a, it's not readable anymore. So I say like, well, that would be like, that's going to be my building block, my, my, my unit to be able to define the breakpoint. So what I did, um, I said, let's start with um, these suites of, one, of 1060. I said like, well, in TechCC, I can fit girders with uh, five columns of 180, but it's just because it's the smallest width I can use, if I remove one column, I have that this kind of 235. So my breakpoint, first breakpoint is 1060, and then when I go, I reduce the whole page until I go to 180. And that's going to define my second breakpoint, uh, 840. Then, and so on and so forth. So from 840, I remove a column, go back to the next time I, I meet the 180 point, and again, and again. So having these units basically help me define all the breakpoints. So basically it's like these breakpoints were device agnostic. It was based on the content. It basically, how the content react to the grid made me change the layouts, right? Which is very different from like designing for an iPad and an iPhone. Then, so we, I ended up having these structures. That's one of the guidelines we gave to the LA Times. Um, so you see like these long, these long black lines, um, that's the breakpoints. All these long black, black lines. But one other question was, well, where do you design? Because we are still designing with flat static compositions. Like, do I design here when it's like really wide or do I need design here right before it breaks, right? So, so to show, you, show it to you, for example, like you see on the side, this is 1280 and this is the 1060 point. That's the extreme of the span, right? So it feels like quite the same, right? It's like, well, no problem. At the same time, well, here on the 160, you're, you see like the relationship between the image and the text is kind of changing. You already, like here, like the, you, the image is big and the text is below like as a caption almost. And here, like is they are almost at the same level. There's always the ads messing up the composition, but like what you're gonna do about this? Um, so anyway, we said like, why don't we just like design in the middle of the span? So it's basically, instead of like designing at the extreme points, just be in the middle. So we have a better sense of what the layout is supposed to look like throughout the span. That's almost done, almost done. <laughs> um, and then we ended up having this. So we have like five spans. So like that's like going from breakpoints to breakpoints. That's the gray lines here. And the layouts we are like doing, well, like the actual composition were happening here in the black lines in the middle. So the other time is like a bit complex because there's like a, the, um, there's the nav on the side and stuff that make it more, things more complex, but basically that's the idea. The other thing is that actually, going back to Carl Gerstner, all these compositions were like mapped on a 20 pixel grid. So it was based on one divider. So all of these comps were mapped on that. So basically, I didn't go exactly in the middle of, of the span, I went, I just be, just pick the one that was about in the middle, but the rational uh, choice to like be in this pixel grid, which make it much easier to like 
have these elements fitting one, like the all going through all the different um, compositions throughout the different sizes. Okay, almost done, almost done on the grid. <laughs> and that's how the comps look like. So that's the larger just comp, the middle one, and again, it's not, it's not like the iPad comp, it's just like it's, connect, it's only the connected to the content. And the smallest one, that's supposed to, the application is going to be for, for phones, but like, it doesn't matter, it's like about the content itself. So the home page would look something like that. Still dense, uh, there's lots of, of text. Uh, but um, again, it's all about the modularity of this page. So just to give you an idea of what we did, so like I, I went through my folders and just to show you like to build, to, to build a page like that, we built like a tons of modules to be able to, to just um, compose the page the way you want to base on the content. So I'm going through all these things that we call ad fits. So it's like, it's content modules. It's the basic set we started with. So this thing is supposed to evolve throughout the time. So we, we just said, all right, okay, to start with, what do we need to have? Some, some grid system, something that was a, like we had like at the beginning was an evolving story. So like something with a live blog, a some different grids, like something uh, visually heavy at the top. So we made all these variations with like different ad situations to have a like starting pack for them to be able to start modular grids uh, and to like change the page throughout the day. Um, so, and that's for the content, and there was like another way to promote content, which is like these l l dark lines, basically more like promotional spots, and again, so it could be like ads, or it could be like a columnist, or it could be like an advertising. So, basically we made all these versions for them to be able to like modify the page throughout the day and every day. That's it for your time. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump over Vanity Fair and GQ right now. No, I said I would jump over it. Can I? No? Uh. Sorry. Okay, I'll, ju I'll jump through it manually. <laughs> you told me about the link, it doesn't work. Told me about the link to jump to the next slide. I have the link, but it doesn't work. Anyway, fine. I think we don't need to go through that. That's all. I think it's better to just. So, um, next project is a very small project I took. Like, um, so while I was working on this project, like the LA Times and this kind of project, I was like taking some small project on the side. And particularly when there was type involved, I was excited about it. I was like, yeah, let's go for it. And this one is a, was a retail store in Miami. And um, so the retail store, uh, yeah, I did the typeface for it. The retail store was a, a small retail store, so that they were not carrying their online. Um, and uh, the style was a preppy surf, pre preppy surf, I believe. So for, if you don't know what's preppy, preppy, I mean, I think in French you would say bon chic, bon genre, okay? It's like the guy who's like preparing themselves to go to like Yale, okay? Beautiful guys, handsome, great style. So I was like, okay, that's, that's cool, uh, and surf, okay? They're like cool, like bon chic, bon genre, and they go surfing, it's Miami. Um, so, so I was looking for some stuff and um, I was like, I stumbled upon this like Marlboro, you see I'm doing a lot of Google search. Uh, <laughs> I'm stumbled upon like this Mar Marlboro uh, uh, packaging and I was like, ah, oh, that's quite cool actually. That's kind of fashion-y but like elegant and like it's a bit manly. I mean it could be, yeah. And um, you know like Mad Men kind of aesthetic, I don't know. Like a Kennedy Mad Men, I don't know. And I was like, well that's cool. Then I looked more, I was like, well, pff, what about the cowboys though? I was like, I was like, what about the horse? <laughs> but I went, <laughs> then I came back to uh, Marlboro. It's like, no, if you look at the at this sizing, that's 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 what I want to do. Something like a bit like very fashiony, elegant, but also like uh, a bit manly, right? And I said, well, first I did the logo, and I said, well, like with the right color, that would work. I would do like something elegant, preppy, and like with the color would be would look surf. So I I started designing the typeface that goes with it for for uh, headers and stuff. 
They didn't ask me, I just did, I just did it. Um, and yeah, and you see like, well, what I did is like having these small like uh, features. So like that's not a stent, well. That's not a stencil, it's more like um, when the Dido uh, web breaking under the pressure of the, the press, right? That's like some, some letters are broken. So it's just to give it a bit of an edge to look more modern. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Going fast. <laughs> uh, the intercept. So uh, the intercept, so okay. So I've been like working for a while at the agency. I left the agency world and I was like, well, I want it, well, okay, well, I'll tell you about like all the projects you've seen, even the ones you haven't seen like GQ and Vanity Fair, like most of them, are, like basically from interview to LA Times through like Vanity Fair and stuff, basically they're not there anymore. I mean, there's some, some part of them I see on the current website, but like they've been like destroyed piece by piece. That's just the nature of it, right? Um, and a lot of time actually, a lot of things get destroyed at the execution level because I wasn't able to, basically if like the, the development wasn't happening in house, basically we're delivering the design like, hey, here's the pizza and you do it. I mean, it's not that they do, we didn't want to, they just didn't have the budget for us to build it. So. And a lot of them I was like very frustrated by the way they were applying some concept and stuff. So I was like, well, I, do I want to do that? Uh, maybe I can find another place for me when I can still doing design for like web publication, but like not, uh, with something where I have like more control over like the actual output. And so, and there was like this place called uh, First Look Media where like there's this new publication called The Intercept. Uh, so to tell you a bit more about The Intercept, so the interest had been funded uh, in 2014 uh, by Glenn Greenwald, uh, Laura Portress, and uh, Jeremy Scarrier. So if you don't know, you've never heard about them, they are like quite, I mean, they're, if you say Glenn Greenwald, like the next thing you go and get in your mind is this guy, uh, Edward Snowden, because they're deeply connected to Edward Snowden. They are the guys that went to, uh, to uh, Hong Kong to interview Edward Snowden, and they brought with them most of the archive, most of the leaks uh, from Edward Snowden. So like their, their image is like deeply um, associated to Edward Snowden. It's not that they're claiming and like using Edward Snowden as a, as a like a, a promotion like a pattern, but the, it's just like people when you think of Glenn Greenwald, you think about Edward Snowden, just what it is. So when I started designing uh, for The Intercept, um, I knew that that was in the background, right? When you think of The Intercept, you think of Glenn Greenwald, you think about like, this kind of like, this engineer looking guy, the actors, you know, like this kind of Mr. Robot aesthetic. So that was there. I was like, in my mind I was like, well, you don't need to reinforce that is there already. But still I, s I saw that you need to like, some way talk about it. Uh, it's annoying, I'm making, it's a loop. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to loop. <laughs> um, so, so this part I know I didn't need to reinforce. Uh, but there's another part that, you, that was like crucial for the intercept that um, they could be seen as radical where actually they were not. They were like people who tried to revive journalism, right? They, they were people who wanted to, basically, for example, like they were investing a lot of researchers just to make sure that like their, their journalism were like, would be like good journalism. And like even the, crafty for the crafting of the, of the journalism was really good. Like the way they were the writing was like, there was a lot of attention, inten um, attention to the crafting of the, their journalism. So to me, I wanted to find a way to connect this tradition of journalism and make The Intercept like a confident brand that is, can be looked at something like new, but like, like web native, new, but like something that like connect to the tradition of journalism. So I knew I wanted to use a serif, but like with a twist. So I connected this type treatment to uh, this underscore that could relate in two ways. One, to computers in general, and to uh, the terminal, like the hacker's terminal, right? But if you think about it, uh, like for example, like a lot of publication, like, con like in their signs, they connect to like a pen or feather to just like, to like talk, to relate to writing. And like the writing today is basically typing on a computer. So basically to me it was another modern way to talk about like the crafting of the writing. Now, um, I want to talk for a minute about uh, the type I used for the logo. Um, 
And actually, I'm glad to talk about this because I think, I think today, Gerhard Unger, who designed this type called Swift, is receiving a medal from the TDC in New York right now, I, I believe. Um, and this typeface like, is very important to me in general, but I thought it was a perfect fit for the intercept. Uh, to me, um, Swift typeface designed by Gartunger in 1985, to me is really the first time, I mean, there's been like things happening before, but like this typeface to me was really clear. Um, there was like something, well, it was the first time I see like clearly articulated something that looks very vector, computer vectors, and something traditional. And with no, I say like, w I, um, basically like the, um, it, was, it wasn't diminishing the traditional aspect. It was reinforcing it. And uh, I'd never seen that before. Um, so it's like to me, like for so publication that well, uh, so the way to, the, um, I wanted to connect to the tradition and have something like that was like modern and web native. I was a perfect fit for me. Also, it's been it's designed it for press, so like basically uh, all the quality were there. And and f personally, I always thought like it was like uh, a milestone in type history for me. So uh, that was my starting point. Now, if you look at the logo, so that's Swift typeface on the left, and that's what I designed on the right. So I didn't like take uh, Gerhard Unger typeface and modify it. Uh, I just designed it, I designed something new from scratch, so it's a bit different. And just like, I wanted to just like uh, uh, say briefly about like um, my ethical view about this, I mean, in, in general. Uh, because I mean, a lot of time I see people like um, taking fonts, modifying them, uh, ask someone to make them a, f make them a font, font file and then sell it to a client and say, well, I designed this font. Um, I don't think it's okay. I don't think it's okay, uh, like uh, technically, but it's not also okay technically. So, for example, like here, technically, I think legally, I'm not a lawyer, but legally, uh, I was covered. I think I, like Gertrude, couldn't come to me and say, "Well, like you ripped off my fonts, you need to pay me something," because technically, like I designed from scratch. There's no, I mean, there's like you can look at it and say, "Oh, well, it looks similar," but like technically, there's not like an actual ripoff, right? Like legally, I believe, right? Uh, but it doesn't matter, actually. What matters is that I did want intentionally to reference this typeface. So what I did is like I sent my work to Gerhard Unger and say, well, this is going to look like an extension of what you did, of your work. It's going to look like Swift, the typeface you designed. Would you let me use it for the logo of the intercept? And he said, okay. And one there he said, okay. But just wanted to highlight that actually, I think that's just the thing like everyone should do, basically. You can just like take someone's work, modify it a bit, and like recycle it and say, well, I did this, right? Um, one thing about the logo also is actually that's the first comp I showed to the client. Um, I call it client, I'm sorry, but even if we're like basically part of the same team, it's just like a, my agency mind keep working. Um, so actually I showed this comp, but first time actually I showed them, I just like handing them my phone, and it was the comp where on the phone, right? And it's an article page. It was different like templates of an article page. Um, and basically the way uh, we were test, I wanted to test the logo is like, well, does it work okay on a phone on an article page? That's the, use, the number one use case where it needs to work. So that's the first, that's the first time they seen the logo is that it was in this context. Now I've been very lucky at this time because Betsy Reed who was the actual uh, editor-in-chief of The Intercept, and she's always been like, I would like to thank her, she's always been very supportive with me. Um, she, we were kind of in line of what we wanted to do for, for the brand of The Intercept. So we moved on, like the logo, logo was okay. There's one thing that was missing, like when you do a logo today, there's, it needs to have like a, a social media counterpart, something you need to put on Twitter, something you need to put on a, a Facebook, something you need on Instagram, or whatever. So. I did do uh, these things that work with it. So we had a lot of conversation inside because they were like, well, it should be TI, TI. And that's all, even the way we called on ourselves, we were like, hey, TI. If that's all, even the way I, I uh, name my files, I do TI something, TI something. And so like, if you think about it, it's more logical to call it TI. It's the first letter of the T and the I, the intercept makes sense. Now, so I spent some time explaining, well, actually, in terms of like branding, First, it needs to work as a shape. It needs to be a symbol. It doesn't need to like, 
doesn't need to like like conceptually people don't need to think about it and say oh yeah t i g intercept they need to look at it and say well that's g intercept and visually having upper lowercase and underscore was just like a, just a better option for the intercept and actually we went with it and uh, so it's fine <laughs> um with the logo i s i started working on the and with a headline typeface for the intercept for the website and the, like for the identity or overall um, so I knew I was going to use Swift for body copy and the serif, and I wanted to have something. I wanted to use contrast to work for headlines, to work to use contrast between the serif and the sans with a, and the and the sans serif. So, what's traditional in the U.S. in the in the newsprint publication or even magazines is to use Franklin Gothic. Franklin Gothic is like the most American Gothic you can think of. Personally, I think it looks a bit French too, but. Uh, um, it's like uh, it's like uh, for America, like it's like the blue jean actually. The blue jean. <laughs> when I think about it, the blue jean is also a bit French. But anyway, so <laughs> uh, yeah, it was French first, right? The blue jean, and then it went to America. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, it's the most American typeface. So that was like that was the starting point. Uh, there's a content version for it, but uh, I picked something else. I picked uh, news gothic. So like, <laughs> it's a news font, obviously. And it's designed by also like the same guy who designed uh, um, Franklin, uh, Franklin is Maurice Fairbon Bunton uh, at uh, America Type Founders. And uh, yeah, 1908. So I did like my interpretation of it. So again, so I always want to have something traditional. So like I wanted to connect to this like landscape of like news, uh, American news publication. Same time, I didn't want to be just like another one. So again, like the technological uh, uh, aspect didn't need to be like the, at the forefront, but it needs to be treated in some way. So I tried to have something that is more like, more like um, I'd say that, uh, normalized than, than, frankly, than the news gothic. I did some stuff to make, make it feel a bit like more like digital or something like that. It's few elements, but like very, very discreet. Like, but it's a bit colder than than news gothic. Also, one criteria I had, I mean, it wanted it needed to be strong for a headline. So I wanted to like be able to set type really tight, and like the color needed to be right for for headlines. Uh, one like arbitrary criteria I had, I don't love like when I mean I love this typeface for sure. Best typeface ever, uh, Alan Fredegar, my God, but um, <laughs> but like I don't love like this thing happening. So basically, I, I say like how heavy I can go to have something like that looks like that be can be low contrast, but like with that keeping a gap between the Y and the T. That was my limit. So I went as far I could go and make something that looks okay for me, as long as this thing well, I could like fit the Y below the T a bit. But I kept like the. If you'd said just the capitals, it f still felt a bit like it's more mechanical, but same way, it feels like still like a bit like American vernacular. So when I write shoe repair store, it looks like an old store. You don't see what I mean? It's like, it's like a, an old brand. So it can still like convey this kind of like tradition feeling. Another thing um, that is particular is that, for example, like I'm like also great typeface. Um, Atlas Grotesque, I'm giving it as a comparison with what I did. So you see like when you see the range of widths from, from thin to uh, black. So a normal typeface, and that's the way it should be, like the widths, the global width is growing, right? The, the black weight is much larger than the thin weight, which is normal because you need to put some, some white space inside the black shapes, which is, yeah, again, that's how it should be. Now, when I'm doing this one, I did not exactly that. I tried to maintain the widths because I didn't have time to do like a super family with like uh, 20 widths. I was, I mean, I was working at night on this thing. <laughs> so I was like, well, I need to f have this program in mind of how I'm going to use it and just like find the right setting for me. So the right setting for me is like, well, I want it to be dark in the headers. So, and so I wanted to see how compact I can be to still be readable, but for large higher. So like the, the blacks, the black were quite compressed like the, as compressed as it could be to keep some readability at the top, but I wanted to have more readability at the regular so that I can like set some small paragraph and still get them readable. So that's why actually through the, through the weight, the width is not growing, it's, it's, it's maintained pretty much the same. Also, to work with it, 
uh, I made a mono version of it. I saw like having like uh, metadata, small type, I, uh, adding a mono would also like talk about technology and have like this kind of cool like techy uh, flavor to it. So yeah, here's the mono, comparison between the mono. It's always cool to be able to like go from the, I mean like to make, like mono is like an excuse to be able to make some cool shapes like the percent or like the, like the T, Y, T. I mean, I'm even like, for example, like the, the, these kind of glitches you see always like in a, in like code. So it's definitely not optimized for coding, but like basically it's always, it's fun to like pretend what well it's a coding typeface. Um, and here's the family. And uh, now I'm going to show you in use. So I'm not going to detail too much about the product. I mean, I can tell you a few things about it. It's a very like, I wanted the product, the digital product to be quite minimal. So you see basically the flow of this content. Like I'm in, in the vertical of Glenn Greenwald and you just go from another article to another. And you see like, for example, like Glenn Greenwald below the logo when you see it is, uh, oh, I'm, okay, I'm too far already. Here is actually the, the normal weight and you see I'm using it, I'm using it for, um, for comments and like you see like small paragraph, it's, very, it's like, it's perfectly readable. Uh, and like, yeah, I was talking about the Glenn Greenwald logo, I should post this. For editorial products, sometimes I use the mono to give more character. The contrast is higher between the serif and the mono than with the, just the song. And uh, also what's interesting, and actually I'm going back and forth between talking about type and, and product, but like here in this flow on the mobile size, um, I think it's interesting to have like basically the promo section, which is like this part, the black part, that is on black background, and the content section is always on a white background. So like when you're scrolling, you have these segments of black and white and black and white to just like segment the content. Also, you just see like the, this like, um, this small like uh, underscore that is flickering, that's also like a motif we use throughout the site. So like every time you're loading something and so, so that it's small details, but like it's kind of like adding the throughout the site have some consistency throughout the brand. Uh, also from the beginning, uh, we knew that we like social media exists, right? Lots of most of the user are going to the site coming from social media. So from the beginning, we like we look at how. Uh, social promotion going to happen. So, and also again, like having the type and having consistent use of the type throughout, throughout like uh, social media promotions were like great for the brand to have like consistency visually. So like this is different like social promo for Facebook and Twitter. Um, now moving more to um, editorial, uh, the editorial part. So you see again like the flickering uh, underscore, and we build like this capacity for the intercept to have multi-part stories where you can connect easily connect uh, multiple articles. Um, so you see like uh, from part one to part two, uh, and uh, well, I, I need to say that at this point, like I brought my friend Philip Hubert to uh, lead the editorial design. So for example, this story I worked with him like all the, on the lead art and stuff to make like, things look good and improve like dramatically the overall uh, editorial aesthetic of the, uh, of the content. Uh, also one thing actually I'm using, this kind of like black shape. So like it's common to see this kind of like, um, how to say that, like uh, something that's some sort of a punctuation in, in a magazine layout to have like a dark shape to like put some, some color inside the layout. And actually like the twist I did here is like, I'm using this black shape like, um, you know, like redacted documents. You see like when you have a, a document when there's a like black stroke on, on top of it. So like I'm doing, I'm trying, to, I try to place these kind of elements that relates really to the intercept. Uh, another editorial product, uh, that's a small uh, surveillance catalog. So we're publishing, like the intercept is a lot about like publishing um, uh, um, protected documents. Like basically the intercept is quite different from WikiLeaks. The intercept would spend the time to study the doc documents, to make some research, to understand what they're publishing before publishing them. So even the intercept is going to redact some documents. They're not just going to dump a tons of like files on the internet and like you deal with it. Uh, and this file was uh, like a surveillance catalog we had and we decided to publish it. Like it's all the tools that actually agencies are using uh, to like uh, spy on people. And you see that that's quite pricey by the way. 
<laughs> and uh, and we actually it's like we wanted to do like a shopping site, and we just like uh, reviews. So we have some experts writing reviews for it. Uh, one of other uh, the your product I worked on was um, drone papers. Was was like a really a big story. <laughs> it was thank you. <laughs> I have a fan. Thank you. <laughs> uh, was the drone paper. Um, so it was a huge package of documents about drone strikes, and uh, yeah, it's a multi-part story. And like uh, I worked with uh, so Tom Conroy was the main developer throughout the whole project, so the whole project of the Intercept. And work, I worked with Tom, and we uh, we uh, made this kind of like system when we have like some flexibility to do like on the same template a lot of variations. Uh, so and actually I permit myself to do like thing where actually you see when you land on the page there's no type at the top. People need to scroll to see the headline. Like people were scared about it. It was like, well, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. People are going to scroll. Um, so anyway, that was like a big deal for the Intercept at the time. Uh, another editorial product, and it's going to be the last one, uh, is uh, one segment of the Sunon Archive. This is an internal newsletter of uh, the NSA. So we started publishing it, and we just like wanted to start it to do uh, a place to store all these archives. So you see like here, because it's a database, it's all like, mo it's mainly mono typeface. You see, I was using the, the different like style of the font for different projects. Oh, you see like the redaction, actually. This shape is the redaction. So yeah, that's, so that was another project. And another way I, I could use the fonts throughout the project. And that's it for the intercept. Let's move to uh, type again. So PS Fournier, Pierre Simon Fournier. So I studied that 2013 and uh, we published it at Typo Fonderie, 2016. So actually I started it when I was uh, still at Code and Theory and I, uh, right before I left actually. So Pierre Simon Fournier uh, is a French Parisian actually type designer from the uh, 18th century. Like the most famous thing he published is this, is uh, Le Manuel Typographique, Utile aux gens de lettres. Um, so, like, it's, uh, it's not a really a rare book. It's like basically all the big uh, libraries at the time had it, a version of it, because it was a very popular book. And um, uh, in the, the just, he was planning to do like three volumes. He just like had the time to do two. Uh, the first volume is, is more like um, describing uh, the history of, of typography, you know, like actu actu actually the, 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 the process of typography, how we do fonts, how we cause them, how we print. And also, uh, like an overview of like all the foundries in Europe and in the world, you know, it was like very uh, savvy, uh, knowledgeable about typography. Um, so, Fournier arrived after like this thing that happened at the end of the 17th century called Romain du Roi. Uh, it's a it's a typeface uh, done for the king, and it was like a huge shift. I mean, today we look at it and say, well, we we think it's a huge shift for typography because, for example, like the mm -hmm. italic here is the first time we see that these kind of letters, like are, are not italics, but like slanted Roman shapes, right? But like I'm not going to detail on Roman Duroy and stuff, but like he came after that and was a huge influence not only on, on, on uh, Fournier, but like pretty much on everyone. Um, so like to give you just a bit of context, uh, he comes, at the, he's like a contemporary of uh, Fleischmann uh, German, like in the Netherlands, and uh, and uh, John Baskerville in Birmingham. Also, like uh, both of them were like working on these kind of tra traditional models. Also, what is inter interesting to say? So I went online, and uh, <laughs> I mean, actually, I know this book, but I didn't have any photos. So, like on this, uh, what is it called? Um, Histoire et actualité du graphisme et de la typographie. Signe. It's great, great uh, database. So that's Bodoni uh, in 1771. And you can see that Bodoni basically at the beginning replicated exactly what Fournier was doing. He basically, like, he, he copied everything. He just reproduced all the type, I mean, as much as he could, the, the ornaments, everything, right? I think Fournier would have been really mad about it, but uh, <laughs> that's how it worked at this time. Um, now, uh, why did I start to do a Fournier? Um, well, uh, through the age, usually when was, there was like a technological shift, we are carrying through like the history of type, type typography. So for example, like 
uh, for mono when mo there was like monotype linotype new technology coming in, we were doing linotype and monotype version of Garamond. We were doing linotype and monotype version of Bodoni, Caslon, Baskerville. So like here, you see monotype 1925, they did two versions of Fournier. Uh, but at the digital age, it did not really happen. Like in the early 90s, we did like great, I mean amazing interpretation of a government. Like we had like tons of like digital Baskerville, uh, tons of botany, but basically we had like, uh, like a digital like uh, digitalization of this type, the monotype one, which is what it is. But like there was not a lot of, of Fournier, pretty much none. Some, but like not a lot. So I was feeling, well, that's a gap we need to fill. <laughs> so I started working on it. Um, also, like Fournier, just like side note, he was also like famous for many things. He, he like he evolved, like for example, like the way we are printing uh, music. Uh, one thing also, like at the time, um, all around the world, like the, the type were not like called, I mean, basically each type had different sizes and the size were not like 12, 12 points, 16 points, 72 points. They were like called Parisian, non pareil, mignon, petit text, and multiple names for like, sometimes like one size has like 10 different names. And like in UK it was different, in the US it was different. So Fournier was advocating to say, to do actually a numerical system. So, and it's basically what we're using now, the point system. Uh, it did not happen at the time of Fournier, but like basically it was the law. It was like basically the biggest push before it happened. Dido made it happen after, based on this system. So now when you do a revival, so like I'm not going to talk about like what is a revival, why a revival. I think you should ask Sumner after. He would have much better answers than me. Uh, but um, I'll tell you like how it worked and how it's been, how it's been done, right? So, so one way to do it, like for example, like Monotype when they did it, they took a reference, this one, Saint Augustin Ordinaire. So that's, that's the Monotype and that's the original, right? The Saint Augustin Ordinaire of Fournier. Very good choice. Uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, uh, size because basically most of the market was here for Fournier. Like the, probably the, the type he perfected the most were around these text sizes, right? So when you do that, so, just showing both like beautiful italics too, so the perfect size to start a revival. And like perfectly represent Fournier. So how do you do it? So you can take, you, you can do like you take, uh, like you say, okay, that's the, be that's the best type from Fournier, the one I like the most. And okay, I'm going to just take this size as a reference and start designing it. So well, you say, well, I'm going to take a random A, and then you say, well, like, well, let's see at the other A's. And you can say, well, oh, but like they're not quite the same though. Like what's the what's this in shape here? Is like is this this one the right one or or this one the right one or this one the right one? Which one is the right one? It's difficult to know, right? It's just like they are. It's just like because of the printing. Well, you don't know exactly what was the intention. You have a loose sense of how it was going, but like you don't know really, right? You need to make some decision, like some interpretation. It's not like obvious what Fournier would do and like take the computer and design the font. We, you don't know. Nobody knows what he would do. And there's like, he may like not just this one. If you say like, well, actually I want to represent Fournier as a whole, you say you need to go through all the sizes. And then you look at the small sizes, like good luck. It's like you have a loose sense, but like it's, it's still Fournier. I mean, it's, it's as Fournier as the other one. And any A as Fournier, Fournier as the other one, but like which one is the right one? Well, how do you start? So you say, well, like one good option is this. It's like, well, the large sizes. Large sizes is easy. It's much more defined. That's clear. Okay, like I see clearly what he wanted to do here. It's perfect. Well, how does it work with the other sizes? And like one thing to know also, it's like Fournier b made this like large size type at the very beginning of his career. Basically, he started it and uh, he didn't do more of it because basically the market wasn't here. Actually, it was quite modern to do this stuff. Even like it's surprising to have like a very large X size, it's uncommon. I mean, compared to what happened before. But like he did this time, like a couple of, ca of, of, uh, of like headers and like large size uh, type and he stopped and focused on the, the text size. So basically, yes, it's more defined, but is it really like the spirit of Fournier? Is it w really what it is? And me, I wanted to, basically my project was to try to find something that looks like Fournier basically. So I couldn't just like stop and take this one and just do this, something that looked like this specific large size. So, so also, one thing also I didn't do is this thing. So when I look at this, all this series of A's, there's one that is odd, is this one, you see? It's like going up, 
and going back down, right? That's like, I'm like, well, that's a print issue. It's like just like printed, right? So when you look at it, yeah, bigger, you see it's going up and then go back down. So maybe it's a print issue. Then you go to another page and you say, well, oh, okay. So it's doing, this one is all of them are like that, all of them. So that's not a print issue. And actually, it's very, it's very nice and it's very modern for the time. It's, con it's a condensed font. This kind of like very modern shape that like it's very uncommon for the time is very modern. And actually, and there's a lot of small details in Fournier that look like very peculiar. And if you want, you could do a typeface that looks like that and it's going to be beautiful. But again, that wasn't my project. My project was to like try to find kind of the essence of Fournier and make something that looks like Fournier, not look like, I, so like it's tempting to like go and like do all the quicks, all the weird stuff that he's doing, or also like push to what's the next step. So you can like be tempted to say, well, like next is going to be Bodoni, so like makes the make it look like more like Bodoni. But that wasn't my project. I didn't want to do that. Um, also, one thing where you need to make decision is this: is like for example, like the text size, you see how the serif and the stem connects with a 90 degrees angle. It's like a flat stem. Uh, and here you see there's a curve, right? Clearly there's a curve. So which, what do you do? Like do you do the curve? Do you do the, the 90 degrees angle? What do you do? Uh, you want all these things to work together. Also there's like odd stuff happening, like this uh, looks like it's rotated a bit. It's like, it's, it's like throughout the whole, like there's a lot of like capitals that, is that are drawn that way. And I'm like, well, is it like something that defines Fournier or is it something that actually can, can get rid of? So I needed, to, I needed to make a lot of decision of like what I would keep and how, what I would sensitize. Um, so I look also like some, some uh, historical reference. I mean, if you look at just the type context, you, don't, you miss uh, a large part of the picture. So I, I started to look like at the calligraphy that was happening at around the time of Fournier. Um, also actually Sumner pointed that to me that at the time, uh, typography was competing with uh, engraving. And you see here, like on, in the frontispiece of a book, you see how uh, engraving could be very refined and how like type could be like a bit like, I don't know, not as refined as, as, uh, as, as uh, engravings. So it was competing with that. You see here again, really detail. This technology was like very detailed. So Funia has that as a reference too. So here is the project now. Um, so that's the choice I've made. So I, I kept an angle in the serif. I, I didn't keep this kind of rotated S. I just make it mo more normal. So basically it's not exactly the same shape, but I try to keep the spirit. Same for um, the lower case, like here's the original. This is what it's in. So like I try to not replicate exactly the same shapes for the text size, but I like, keep the spirit. I'll go more quickly. Um, and for the large ISM saying it's not exactly the same, but uh, I tried to just keep the speed. For example, like one thing, like this very big uh, terminal on the R, I didn't keep it re really here, but I tried to have something, I keep, have, keep some singularity in it compared to the other shape, but I tried to find something that worked throughout the whole system and like still feels like Fournier. Um, then that's the whole family. So that's like the large sizes, the normal sizes and the text size, the like small sizes and they are like, quite the same and a, a bit like quite different at the same time. So you see like the one thing also I did that is uncommon that is more modern actually for the time is the text, the small size has a smaller uh, X side than the, the large sizes, which is like usually the opposite. If you look at the Garamond, it would be the opposite. But basically because Fournier was doing this uh, poster type, I was thinking that it's more, more modern and a more better tribute for Fournier. Um, italics, one thing also like for example, like for text sizes, I would like simplify details that you can find. So here you see this kind of like round shape happening here, would not happen at the text size. And uh, just like some text, so I'm just going to do some uh, <laughs> type pornography right now. Uh, show <laughs> some big letter shapes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm just going to go through like very uh, large size of like the, the uh, grand sizes. Uh, combination of different like uh, high contrast, low contrast. Here, that's the probably the, the smallest contrast is small caps on the, on the black textile. 
overview of the character set. And you see on the character set, at the bottom, there's like some ornaments. Uh, so nobody is going to ever use that except Felix. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so I didn't think you could do a real tribute for Fournier if you were not working on the ornaments. And I, well, I was looking at these beautiful uh, book covers that were done at the time. I said, well, I need to do, to do this. So I spent a lot of time like, making enough uh, ornaments for someone. If someone one day wants to use them and like, replicate this kind of like, uh, um, uh, beautiful covers. And that's it. Thank you, Fournier. And now, nothing, just going to finish with this. Uh, so I just joined like a few months ago a new publication called The Outline. And uh, I'm not going to show anything. I'm just going to show you this. I'm, I'm done. Promised. Um, that's the thing I did for the 404 page. It was, it was just after the election. We launched the publication six months ago, just after the election of Donald Trump in the, in the United States. And like in New York, it was devastating. Like people were like zombies in the street. They were like, what happened? What happened? And uh, I just like thought for the, for the um, 404 page, having like a portrait of him and so like this like sentence that is common for 404, something went wrong, was perfect. And that's it. Thank you. Question. No question. Okay. okay, okay. Yes, please. Okay, this might be an obvious question. Uh, so maybe just tell me if I missed something. But for the intercept, if you adore Swift so much, why did you not take it? Well, uh, so I use Swift throughout the whole, all, every serif you see on the intercept is Swift typeface. For the logo, so I wanted to have some, I, I needed to adapt it to have something that works better with what I was trying to do. So if you look at it, it's a bit, a, just like it's a bit heavier than the heaviest weight of Swift, a bit more compact, and um, also a bit more contrast to make it feel more elegant. So basically this, this specific style of suit didn't exist, and that's that's the like simple answer. And actually, that's just that, honestly that's what I did. Two, I always like to draw our letters, so that I would do that all the time anyway. Even if like I, I I can't help but like drawing letters. That's just what I do. Yeah, I guess my follow-up question would have been: Did you ask Herard if he wanted to draw a more elegant version of it? No, it was too late. I mean, I just asked him. Well, first of all, well I. I don't. I don't think I. W I mean, I didn't think that I wanted to do uh, like a full uh, type uh, type set of the type. So I, would, I, I mean, I don't think I had the budget to do a commission actually, <laughs> and it was done already. So basically, if would have told me, I mean, it was basically it was his choice. He could have mean, well, if you need something from me, I can draw it for you. It would be it would have been totally fine. I would like probably fight to find the budget for it, but like I showed him my work and he was okay with it. So okay, it's Thank just you. the way it happened. More question. What is your next typeface? Uh? My next typeface? It's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, uh, how to, def to describe it? I mean, I uh, it's nothing to do with Fournier. It's a post-war. Uh, post-war mechanist. Post post-war industrial, let's say. <laughs> when it will be ready? Well, I think, uh, or you tell me. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't I'll show you to me. You tell me if it's ready or not. <laughs> I don't know. I never <laughs> seen anything, so I don't I'll know. show you this one. Ah, yes? When? I don't prefer A year ago, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Almost done. <laughs> what is it for? Yeah. Microphone, microphone. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, so I have like a... So, I don't take, um, I mean, I don't take, I don't have time to take anyway type commissions. So, <laughs> it's just my self initiated project. So, it's like Fournier. It's for nothing. It's for me. <laughs> it's just like I'm doing like the, the type I want to design, which is like actually work 
great for me. <laughs> I just want to, I mean, I, I spend the week doing like uh, work for clients. I'm glad to be able to work on like my own type project. Microphone, please, for, uh, where is the microphone? Yeah. For live stream, it's important to have so the microphone. Now we are seeing like a shift between, you know, uh, print type and digital type, which is, has its own characteristics. It's more open and uh, curves are more clean, etc. How do you think it will be in like in 10 years, uh, how people will see uh, this digital typeface? They will be using them or maybe there will be another shift? Uh, but it's your vision. <laughs> so, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. You're saying that Swift today looks v looks like modern, but like how it's going to look in the future? Well, <laughs> well if I knew, I mean, <laughs> uh, I have no idea how it's going to look in the future. I just think that like, well, um, it's, well, okay, I'll tell you something. Like the typography always like feels like a conversation with technology. Basically, when Gutenberg invents like typography, he doesn't invent like a new, a new uh, aesthetic. He, he invents a technology first. He has the capacity to like craft the letter shit and stuff. But like, he's not trying to do a new way of drawing letters. It's a new technology. So that this conversation between like technology and it's true before typography, right? So like this conversation between like type and technology is like true, like and it can take different shapes. Like for example, like a mono feels technological, but like uh, some type has been like you see that it's been like render with scripts, that looks also very te technological, right? This conversation is going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. through, the, through, the, through typography all the time is never going to stop. Um, now you can say actually what technology is basically what define humans in general, right? It's the Prometheus thing, right? So it's just like us having the conversation with technology. S S Stefan, uh, what do you think about the, the people saying that uh, the shape of typeface is not exactly what you're saying, so I, I want that you explain a little bit about that. Th there is a lot of people saying that their shape are influenced by technology. And what are you seeing is a little bit different of this st statement. So for example, people like Amy, to, to say something quite very basic, yeah. they are influenced by the technology, but the bitmap shape or yeah. by the limitation of the computer. So they yes. design something based on that. What is, uh, what is your point of view about well, this thing versus what you explain to well, uh, basically, it's, it's, it's like, uh, it's the same thing to me. It's like, there's, a t to me, like, typography is always, like, a conversation with technology. So, like, sometimes sometime you try to make a, a garment that looks like it's been printed, and you try to hide the technological aspect. You say, well, it looks like in the books of, of uh, Estienne. But it's done uh, with basic curve on but design. But it's done with basic curve, like, try to hide it. But sometimes you try to emphasize it, and you're going to do a pixel font to make it look like, hey, that's, like, the font of the computers. Like, uh, but, like, I mean, there's a, like another analogy that is. I mean, yeah, yeah, but this is more um, more um, a style effect rather than say I have a limitation, so I'm not able to design like that, and yeah. I restrict myself because of of this technology. Yeah. This is more like I I try to emulate something. Yeah. Well. So. Uh, so, yeah, it's true. Like for example, like what, why I say like it was a landmark for me, Swift. So I remember like this interview of uh, Herbie Hancock, he's taught, like someone asked Herbie Hancock like who uh, impressed you the most? It was like early 80s interview of Herbie Hancock, the pianist, the jazz pianist. And he said like who impressed you the most? And he said Stevie Wonder, because Stevie Wonder didn't play piano on a keyboard, on a like synthesizer. He played synthesizer. And like Swift to me is that. He didn't try to like, he, he, like, he has his traditional background, but he didn't try to play pli piano on a synthesizer. He like used the synthesizer while it's supposed to, to, to sound like. So that's like where you see like, that's why actually it's very impressive. It's like you have this uh, articulation between like traditional shape and this new medium. Yeah, but uh, craft work um, is completely well, different, but they use the technology also sure. compared to Steve Wonder. Exactly, well, I'm saying like, I'm saying like, but it's more direct in, in case of well, craft work. Well, basically you can emphasize the technological aspect, reduce it, but sometime like you'll be able to, basically what I think is like, for example, why at the time, wh what Gil is saying, well, like when at the time of the Romans, when you ask them, like, what do you see in your mind when I say the letter shape A? He said, like, they're going to see, like, an engraved letter. Why? It's probably because, like, when we've seen, like, this effect of the light on this triangular shape, I mean, like, people were looking at that, they probably said, like, wow, that's, that's incredible, it's beautiful, like, the effect of, like, this technology just, like, like magnified the effect of the, of the brush stroke. 
so much that actually it became the reference, right? That's why actually when people were doing books, they were still have in mind these like reference, right? So you can like be, find a way to be in phase with the technology you're using, like contracting them, but it's always this conversation. So that's, that's, so I don't know how it's going to look in the future. It could be like, that can take a lot of different expression, but like this, this is happening. All, it's like a constant conversation we have. For example, like Vim Crowell, like when you look at Vim Crowell typefaces, like he was saying at the time, well, the computer won't, won't adapt to us. That's why we need to adapt the, our typefaces to the computers. <laughs> Actually, like the computers proved him wrong like 100 times. It's like, it's exactly the opposite that happened. We never had this quality in typography. At the same time, like the type he did was like, uh, like was talking about technology and like, ah, oh, great. I mean, that has a, like a expressive uh, um, type that talks about technology. See what I mean? So just to me, it's just like, we're going to see happening this conversation throughout the history of type, uh, typography. That's just like, but I don't have, I have no idea of how it's going to look like in the future. Uh, another question. No more question. Where is the microphone? I have, it's that's my question. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Stefan, for your talk. And uh, we'll see you, the people online, in about 20 minutes. So we have to say <laughs> goodbye. <laughs>